Amen. So good to be here this morning. We're going to start our time together singing worship. Would you please stand? Good morning, Bridge Church. I am glad you are here joining us this morning, whether you are in person or online. 
Glad you're here. My name's Lee, and here at The Bridge, we are uh, a people who love Jesus. We want to help people connect with God and develop them into fully voted followers of Jesus. That's what we're all about. And so uh, on your way in, if you've got a program, I'd love for you to take that out. There's a couple of things I want to go through and bring to your attention. So you'll notice uh, today the Packers and Vikings play. And so uh, all the men are invited to watch that in the theater, which is just straight back through these doors and off to the right. And uh, how we practice gospel fluency is remembering that uh, our security comes from God, right? Not from a, a win or a loss from an opposing team. I'm looking at you Vikings fans. That's funny because I'm a Packers fan. Okay. All right. Uh, so, again, beverages will be provided, and you're encouraged to bring a snack or some food to share. You notice also a trunk or treat that's happening on Halloween, October 31st, from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. in the church parking lot. If you'd like to participate in that, please use the QR code to sign up. And I, I was told that we need, we have about nine, I, I believe, right now, trunks. And we just need a few more to make it a great thing for our, our community and our neighborhood to participate in. So, uh, trunk or treat, uh, please, we need some more trunks to, to get some treats out of. So, uh, you'll notice some... Uh, inserts in here for Operation Christmas Child, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You'll see something in there about Hope Gospel Mission. We're doing a training. And lastly, I would love for you, inside of here is a communication card. So I'd love for you to pull that out right now. There's, a, there's maybe a pen in the seat back pocket or some pens available near and around you. If you need one, you can raise a hand. I'm sure an usher can get one for you. So we'd love for you to fill out this. I'll give you a little bit of time right now. Today's date is October 29th, 1029. I'd love for you to put your first uh, first and last name with, on that. And then you'll notice uh, on the back side, there's a place for you to write comments and prayer requests. And we really take these prayer requests serious. This is a way for us to get to know you, get to know what's going on in your life, and just pray for you and care for you in that way. And so... Uh, I would, as you guys are continuing to fill it out, I just want to invite, we're going to do a child dedication this morning, so I don't want the families who are dedicating children to come on up as well as the elders, so you guys can come on up. This is a, a great privilege to be dedicating these children this morning. They represent families that, that want their children to grow to love Jesus. And we recognize as parents that uh, the, uh, the days may seem long, but the years are short, and uh, we only have them for a short while. And so it's, it's appropriate that we uh, dedicate them to the Lord. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see Hannah dedicating her son Samuel to the Lord. And in Luke chapter 2, we see Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem to dedicate him to the Lord as well. Now, a baby dedication, a child dedication doesn't do anything magical, doesn't save the child. Uh, what it does is it expresses the desire of the parents to raise that child to know and love him. And it calls upon the family of believers here in the church to join with them in that effort. And so uh, we read the, the words of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts impress them on your children. That word impress implies a, the, the print made in soft clay. And we recognize that that clay is only soft for a certain amount of time, and we have the opportunity to make an imprint on it. We want to do that together. So let me address the parents. Parents, your own love for the Lord is vitally important in terms of your child coming to know him themselves. Uh, so the starting point in raising your children to love God with all that they are and have is you, uh, with your love for God yourself. Uh, you're the primary influencers in your child's life. And the church can help, but God charges you with the responsibility of influencing your children toward a relationship with him. And that's a continuous activity, not just a Sunday and Wednesday thing. And so it's, it's a matter of daily 
talking about God, pointing them to God, encouraging them to turn to him. And so recognizing that responsibility, I want to invite you parents to respond with an affirmation of your own and publicly proclaim your desire to lead these children to God. Parents, by coming forward today, do you dedicate yourselves and your children to the Lord? Do you commit before God and these witnesses to raise these children in the training and instruction of the Lord? Do you affirm that you will love your child unconditionally, trusting God in faith to lead them to himself? If so, please say, we do. <coughs> Modeling this kind of love to your children can't be done alone. We rely on, on the body of believers here to help. This is one of the purposes of the church, to help parents dis discipline or disciple their children. So I want to address you now, congregation. Would you please stand with these parents? I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to these parents who stand before you and their children. Congregation, do you commit with God's help as you have opportunity to influence, teach, and love one of these children, that you will do so with the love of Christ so that these children might one day trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. If you'll accept that responsibility, please say, we do. Thank you. Please be seated. Kyle. Start by thanking Andrew and Katie for bringing forward Donovan and Jude, and they chose this verse, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, not let the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast joy, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to give thanks for Donovan and to dedicate his life to you. We ask that you bless Andrew and Katie with wisdom and patience as they desire to raise their family in a way that honors and glorifies you. Life is a gift from you, and we're grateful for the gift of God, Donovan. We pray that you will be his shepherd. Lord, make him to lie down in green pastures. May you lead him beside still waters. Restore his soul. May you lead him into paths of righteousness for your namesake. Yes, even though he will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may he fear no evil, for you are with him. May your rod and your staff comfort him. May you prepare a table before him and make his cup run over. May he dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Always assist him to grow in wisdom and statue, in grace and knowledge, in kindness, compassion, and love. May Donovan serve you faithfully with a whole heart devoted, devoted to you all the days of his life. May he discover the joy of your presence through a daily relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. They also bring forward Margaret June today to be dedicated, and their verse is Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear that when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we come to you to get today to give thanks for Margaret and to dedicate her life to you. Life is a gift from you, and we're grateful for the life of Margaret. We pray that you will be her shepherd. Lord, make her to lie down in green pastures. May you lead her beside the still waters. Restore her soul. May you lead her into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yes, even though she will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may she fear no evil, for you are with her. May your rod and your staff comfort her. May you prepare a table before her and make her cup run over. May she dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Always assist her to grow in wisdom and stature, in grace and knowledge, in kindness, compassion, and love. May Margaret serve you faithfully with a whole heart devoted to you all the days of her life. May she discover the joy of your presence through a daily relationship with you, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Jens and Indigo are bringing forward Bertie Florence to be dedicated. And they chose the verse Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to give you thanks for Bertie and to dedicate her life to you. We ask that you bless Jens and Indigo with wisdom and patience that they desire to raise their family in a way that honors and glorifies you. Life is a gift from God, and we're grateful for the gift of Bertie. We pray that you will be her shepherd. Lord, make her to lie down in green pastures. May you lead her beside still waters. Restore her soul. May you lead her into paths of righteousness for your namesake. Yes, even though she will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may she fear no evil, for you are with her. May your rod and your staff comfort her. May you prepare a table before her and make her cup run over. May she dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Always assist her to grow in wisdom and stature and grace and knowledge and kindness, compassion, and love. May Bertie serve you faithfully with a whole heart devoted to you to all the days of her life. May she discover the joy of your presence through a daily relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Seth and Rachel Erickson are bringing Tenley Ruth to be dedicated. They have chosen uh, Matthew 5, 5 through 10. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God, heaven. And now we'll pray for her. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I present Tenley to you. I thank you for her life. I pray she would come to know you at a young age and learn to love you and follow you all her days. I pray that she would experience your love and grace. Would you protect her from the evil one and bless her life. In Jesus' name, amen. Next, we have Jacob and Bethany Talage, who are bringing Nicholas Christian to be dedicated, and they have chosen Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Let's pray for him. Heavenly Father, I present Nicholas to you. I thank you for his life. I pray he would come to know you at a young age and learn to love you and follow you all the days of his life. I pray he would experience your love and grace. Would you protect him from the evil one and bless his life? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dylan and Cassidy Howell are bringing Nolan to be dedicated. Hey, buddy. Yeah, it's you. <clears throat> they chose uh, this, their verse to be uh, 127, 3 through five, 5 from Psalms here. It says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. So let me pray for Nolan. God, we present Nolan to you. God, we pray that he does uh, come to know you at a young age. God, we do pray that he would live in your security and your grace. God, that would be a transforming love and experience of you, that he would delight in you. And that would lead to obedience and care for others toward, uh, and just love towards you, God, that would lead to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And so we thank you for Nolan, and we uh, dedicate him to you. The Howells also bring this little cute girl rocking a bow, Collins, and uh, the verse they chose for Collins was 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, uh, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, love, faith, and purity. So we'll pray for Collins. God, we pray for Collins. We pray that she comes to know you as a young age as well, that she lives out of a security in you, that she knows that she is seated uh, with you. God, that if, if uh, just by your son, God, that we know that we are loved, that you demonstrated your love for us, that while you were, we were still sinners, you died for us. So I pray that she comes to know you in this way and that uh, she'd be honoring and glorifying to you and that would lead to the film to the Great Commission. And so we thank you for Collins. Amen. The Strombergers, Jason and Janessa, they are bringing Lena Catherine. So the verse they had chose for Lena Catherine was Deuteronomy 6, 5, and 6. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Let me pray for Lena. So, God, we thank you for the Strombergers. We thank you for Lena. We present her to you. God, I do pray that these things would be uh, on her heart, that you would impress 
uh, them on her heart from young age, that you would apply uh, your truth through the Holy Spirit on her life and that she would come to know you and that she would live out her faith that would show value to you and to others and that, uh, God, it would be clear uh, that she would represent you and your kingdom well. And so we thank you for Elena and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jasmine Hayworth is bringing her four sons to be dedicated, Kingston, and Kylo, and Michael, and Ocean. And the verse that she's chosen is from Mark chapter 9, verses 36 and 37. Jesus took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. So I want to pray for each of them. So let me pray for Kingston. Let me put my hand on you and pray for you, buddy. Lord Jesus, I, I pray for each of these boys, and I pray uh, that you would cause each of them to put their trust in you at an early age. And I pray for Kingston right now that you would make him a leader for you. I pray that he would have insight and wisdom to lead his own life well, and I pray that he would lead his brothers well, that he can be an influencer for you in their lives and in the lives of people that he will meet as he grows up. So I commit him to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Kylo, you're next, buddy. I want to pray for you. Let me put my hand on your head and pray for you. Father, I, I just pray for Kylo right now and ask that you would cause him to love you and to love your word. I pray that your word would dwell richly in his heart, that he would treasure your word, that he would um, study your word and apply his word to your life and share it with others around him. In Jesus' name, amen. Michael, you're next, buddy. I'm going to pray for you. Okay, Father, I, I pray for Michael and ask that you would make him a man of prayer. I pray that he would draw near to you in prayer, that he would count the privilege of praying and, and coming to you with the things on his heart. I pray give him insight into your will and give him strong answers to prayer that will encourage others as well. I commit him to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to pray for Ocean. Hey, Ocean. Hi, buddy. Father, I just pray for Ocean right now that you would make him a man of compassion, one that would see needs around himself and would be able to respond to those needs with the love of Jesus. Let that love live in his heart and reach out to others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. And Blake and Catherine Herbison are bringing Ian Blythe Herbison to be dedicated. They've chosen John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. And when they shared that with me, they shared this note as well. Our deepest desire for Ian is that he would faithfully accept the free gift of salvation by God's grace through Jesus Christ. Beyond that, anything else is a plus. And we trust the Spirit to do a good work through Ian. So let me pray for Ian. Father, I just pray for Ian right now that he would come to know you at a young age, that he would make Jesus his great treasure in life, that he would see him as, as the treasure beyond all price, and that he would give his life fully to the one who has given himself for Ian. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together as, as a family of God and pray for these. Father, thank you for these parents. I pray that you would equip them and uh, let them serve you well as they raise their children to know you and love you and leave that impression on them that draws them to you and that uh, causes them to want to follow you themselves. And so help these parents to set that kind of example and be that kind of influence in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you all. We invite you to stand, and we're going to continue our time together in worship. Hebrews 1, 3, and 4 is talking about Jesus.
He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's sing praise to our Jesus.
God, you are so good, and as we just sang, you are powerful. Your name itself, Jesus, is power and beautiful. We just love you and are so thankful for you this morning. Um, I just, we invite you to um, fill our minds and just help us look to you this morning. In your name we pray, amen. You can be seated.
When that shoe box is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. You can hear the laughter. You can hear the cheer. That excitement, it goes and goes and goes. Right now, we're in Ukraine, and today we've given out the 200 millionth shoe box to a little girl here. So it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege for us to be able to come and to help the people as much as we can. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's so much joy that one gift box can give. They really experience the love of Jesus. Operation Christmas Show, we celebrate something as simple as the shoe box because God uses it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a full box on this team. This is such an amazing time. We're so happy to be here. This shoe box gift will impact a child's life all year round. We never dreamed we'd have an army of men and women who would come to make this program happen. This is what it's all about, telling others about Jesus. These shoe boxes go into 120 different countries where pastors and missionaries are going to use them to bring the gospel to kids. So you may think it's just a simple gift at Christmas time, but it's the gift of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. When that shoe box leaves that distribution center and it goes around the world, that's not just one person. That's the body of Christ joined together, delivering the good news of the gospel. They go by plane, they go by ship, they go by riverboat, they go by camels, they go by motorbikes. And these boxes go to some of the most remote areas of the world. And every box counts. After receiving shoe boxes, children are invited to participate in the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. These children have just completed 12 lessons in the Greatest Journey. I believe that discipleship is the key and they are now followers of Christ. They will tell their friends about Jesus. My name is Gladys and I am nine years old. My friend Kemi told me I needed to go with her to church. I wanted to teach her about the Word of God. And when she came to my church, she received a gift box. For a long time, I asked my mom for a blanket. When I opened my shoe box, I found a blanket in it. When I came home, I showed it to my mom, and she said it was great. I told her about Jesus. Now me, my mom, my grandma, and Kemi go to church together. I am certain of one thing. God is my savior. Every box counts. Every box touches a child. It's like a snowflake. There's not one shoebox that is the same. And we are reaching millions of children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. We are seeing churches being planted, and more and more churches are being built. We will do whatever it takes to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? The joy, the smiles, it changes lives. Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. I'm Karen Beal, and we will be participating in Operation Christmas Child again this year. This is a great outreach opportunity for each and every one of us. In the 11 countries where shoebox gifts are packed, Operation Christmas Child provides an opportunity for us to be part of fulfilling the Great Commission. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them, oh gosh, sorry, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Matthew 28, 19. In this church-to-church ministry model, churches who pack shoebox gifts partner with local churches around the world as they share God's love with children in need and provide follow-up discipleship through the greatest journey. Shoeboxes will be available after the service today in the lobby and November 5th and 12th. All shoeboxes need to be returned no later than Sunday, November 19th. We have lists for you with suggested gift ideas for each age category, boys or girls. Each box has a suggested donation of $10, which covers packing, shipping, handling, and the gospel booklet. I wanted to thank our women's prayer group for building all the boxes. <laughs> um, thank you for being part of Operation Christmas Child and bringing joy and the gospel to children all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bridge Kids, is this a great day or what, huh? You got to see some kids dedicated to the Lord. You got to hear about the shoebox thing where you can bless kids all over the place. Now you get to be blessed. Time for you to go to Bridge Kids, have a wonderful time, and learn more about Jesus. What a great day. Now I can just pronounce the benediction and off you go. I do have a message for you, and, uh, but I'll, I'll promise I'll have you out before the opening kickoff, okay? So we're in uh, John's gospel these days, uh, and we're in chapter 18 this week. And so I would encourage you to open to John chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, couple guys coming down the aisle right now with Bibles. Just catch their eye, and they'd be glad to give you one. And uh, you can turn to page 754 in that Bible to find the passage we are dealing with. John chapter 18, verses 12 to 27. It's really good to have one open in front of you so you can kind of see what's going on in the narrative. As I uh, prepared this message this week and, and just read this passage over and over, it struck me how much like a drama this passage lays out as. Uh, there is action, there is suspense, there are scenes shifting from one to another and back again. Uh, and so I want to invite you to use your imagination with me this morning and picture the whole thing being acted out here on this platform in front of you. The first part that we come to is what I would call the prologue, and uh, it takes place in front of the curtain. So picture the curtain here, and in front of the curtain, we have this scene showing up before us that we read about in verses 12 to 14. So follow along as I read verses 12 to 14. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. So this prologue in front of the curtain uh, takes place just after the action we looked at last week in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was there with his disciples and Judas came with a detachment of soldiers and a number of people from the high priest's court. The lights come up on this scene to reveal Sort of a scene frozen in time. Nobody's moving. The actors are there, but they're not moving. And we see that they have just arrested Jesus. They have bound him with ropes. And they're about to take him to an illegal midnight trial at the home of the high priest. Jesus offers no resistance, but we know that he is no helpless victim. He's already shown us just a glimpse of his glory and power in that scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
where he said, I am, and the soldiers fell down. We see them about to take Jesus off the stage. And there's a narrator on the stage, and he tells us that they will cross the Kidron Valley, and they'll go over the brook that will soon flow red with the blood of more than 200,000 Passover lambs. They'll bring Jesus to Annas, who isn't exactly the high priest that year, but who served as high priest from 6 A.D. to 15 A.D. when he was deposed by a Roman official named Gratus. And when Annas was deposed, his son Eleazar took over as high priest. And after Eleazar, his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And then after Caiaphas, there would be four more sons of Annas in succession, serving as high priest. But a high priest was supposed to serve for a lifetime. So even though Rome had deposed Annas, the Jews still recognized him as the real high priest. So the dynasty continues. Annas remains the power behind the priesthood. This is the one that they will bring Jesus to. And when Annas is done with Jesus, he will hand him over to Caiaphas. Caiaphas is officially the high priest. Annas knows that if he's going to get the thing that he wants from the Romans, that is a crucifixion, he's got to have the current high priest as president of the Sanhedrin sign off on it. But that president of the Sanhedrin is his son-in-law. And so he knows that's going to be an easy sign-off to get. There's a little foreshadowing in verse 14. It tells us that Caiaphas is the one who said it would be better for Jesus to die than for the nation to be threatened. And that, that thing that he said happened back in chapter 11. We looked at it several weeks ago. It was after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And Sanhedrin meets in chapter 11 out of concern for Jesus' rising popularity, and they're wondering what to do about it. If his popularity continues to increase, they reason the Romans are going to come down hard on them. And Caiaphas sees a simple solution. Take Jesus out. It's better that this one man die, that the whole nation be put at risk. As the drama unfolds then, we realize that what follows is not going to be a fair trial. The verdict has already been pronounced. The stage lights go down. The actors leave the front stage in the dark. And then the curtain rises. Scene one, the courtyard, starting at verse 15. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple who was known to the high priest came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You, weren't, you aren't one of this, this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. So the lights come up on stage left and reveal a gate with a courtyard at center stage. Stage right is dark. The soldiers with Jesus, enter from stage left, and they stop at the gate. It opens as soon as they arrive. The people inside the courtyard have been waiting for them. And as quickly as it opens for them, it closes behind them. Peter and another disciple have arrived, but only the other disciple gets to go in. Peter is left outside the gate. 
we may wonder who that other disciple is. Some have suggested that it's John, the author of the gospel. John never refers to himself by name, but he generally calls himself the disciple Jesus loved, not the other disciple. Think about this as well. John is a fisherman from Galilee. He wouldn't be known to the high priest. So who might that leave? Well, there's Nicodemus, who's a member of the Sanhedrin. He would be known to the high priest. He was a secret follower of Jesus. He showed up in chapter 3, coming to Jesus at night with some questions. He showed up later defending Jesus. Could be him. There's also Joseph of Arimathea, the man who loaned his tomb to Jesus. He too was a member of the Sanhedrin. Could be either one of those, but doesn't much matter at this point. The other disciple, whoever he is, goes into the courtyard, speaks to a couple of people, and then comes back to the gate. He speaks to the servant girl who's on duty. She's an employee of the high priest, and she lets Peter in after he's spoken to her. And as Peter passes, she asks him a question. You're not one of his disciples too, are you? The question is stated in such a way that it expects a negative answer. And Peter is happy to oblige. Uh-uh, not me. Nope. Shakes off the question with a quick no and presses past her. A small lie, Peter thinks. A small price to pay to get to where the action is. And Peter wants to be where the action is. Peter sizes up the situation in the courtyard at center stage and decides he'd better try to look as inconspicuous as he can. It's a cold night. It's a group of people standing around a charcoal fire. And if he didn't join them, he would look really conspicuous. And so he decides to try to fit in. He quietly approaches the group tries to blend in, keeps his head down, hoping his face isn't seen and identified. He thinks at least it's a charcoal fire. He wouldn't want to be standing next to a wood fire that blazes and throws light on the faces of everybody around it. So far, so good, Peter thinks. Peter uses his vantage point to try to see what's going on inside the house of Annas, the man who used to be high priest, who remains the power behind the priesthood. The lights go down on stage left. Scene two, Annas' house. Look at verses 19 to 24. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Lights now come up on stage right. They reveal not a courtroom, but a house. It's very well furnished. It's the home of Annas, the man who served as high priest for 10 years before being deposed by the Romans. And Jesus is led into a spacious receiving room. Annas has been waiting for this moment. Like a skilled trial attorney, he begins the questioning, asking Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Who are your disciples? Give me their names. No answer. What have you been teaching? What's your authority? 
Annas knows it's not proper to question a defendant directly. But he does it anyway. He wants to get this done and get to bed. It's after midnight already. Jesus tells him in answer that his teaching has been out in the open, in the synagogues and in the temple, where any Jew could hear him. There's been nothing done in secret. His accusers could have heard it all themselves. And they probably did. He invites the high priest to talk to witnesses who've heard his teaching. There are plenty of witnesses. And his invitation to talk to them reminds the high priest that it's witnesses he should be questioning, not the defendant. And one of the staff members of the high priest takes offense at the invitation, and he hits Jesus with a rebuke and a slap across his face. Literally, he gave him a blow, it says. It would be the first of many blows that Jesus would receive in the next 12 hours. Jesus appeals to the law that these Jews claim to cherish. He has only reminded them that they should be questioning witnesses and not him, as there are plenty of witnesses available if they would care to bring some in. And he says, if I've said something wrong, let me know what it is. But if I have told the truth, then you shouldn't strike me. Those two words, wrong and truth, are literally evil and good. If I've said something evil, then point it out. If I've said something good, you shouldn't strike me. And what he's saying is, I am one or the other, so let's have a fair trial and make that decision. But Annas has seen enough The fair trial Jesus has asked for is not going to happen. It never was going to happen. But the official seal of approval needs to come from the president of the Sanhedrin. And that just happens to be Annas' son-in-law. And so with a dismissive wave, Annas has his temple guards take Jesus, still bound, across the courtyard to the home of the currently reigning high priest, Caiaphas. The lights go down on stage right. And they come up now on stage left once again, where we find scene three, the courtyard, verses 25 to 27. One of the high priest's servants, am I in the right place? 25 to 27. Here we go. The print is really small, and the numbers are even smaller. Here we go. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. The lights come up on Peter. We see him standing by that charcoal fire, trying to look inconspicuous, but also trying to hear what's going on inside of Annas' house. He sees Jesus being led out across the courtyard under heavy guard, and Peter weighs his options. Somebody notices that Peter has been trying to see through the window into Annas' house, trying to hear what's going on inside. And they ask the same question the servant girl asked at the gate. You're not one of this guy's disciples too, are you? Again, it's stated in such a way that it anticipates a negative answer. And so it's relatively easy for Peter to shrug off again with another quick denial. Just trying to buy some time, Peter thinks. It's no big deal. And then it happens. Somebody else at that fire looks at Peter's face, looks at his clothes, sizes him up. This man was there in the garden when Peter took out his sword and took a swipe at the servant of the high priest. And to make matters worse, This guy's a relative of that man that Peter struck with his sword. And he says, wait a minute. I recognize you. 
You were there in the garden with Jesus, weren't you? And this time, the question is stated in such a way that it anticipates a yes answer. It's a pretty direct accusation. And now Peter isn't just trying to buy some time. Peter is now trying to save his own skin. And so he denies it for a third time. But he can't just shrug it off this time. According to the other Gospels, he accompanies this third denial with oaths, calling down judgment on himself if he's lying, just to make his lies seem more believable. And at that moment, the rooster crows. The thing that Jesus said would happen, the thing that Peter thought was unimaginable, has happened. And according to the other gospel writers, Peter leaves the courtyard and weeps bitterly. And the curtain comes down. What do we do with this drama in the courtyard? We need something to take home with us today. There's a lot we could look at in this narrative, but let's just focus on Peter for now. If we were to ask Peter for a lesson he took away from this experience, what would he say? I think he'd say that God had to break him in order to make him useful. Think back to an earlier time, one when Jesus was asking his disciples who people said he was. In Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Congratulations, Peter. You got this one right. And then in that very same chapter, Jesus goes on to tell his disciples more of his mission. In verse 21, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. Never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter, you blew it. You're thinking earthly, fleshly, worldly thoughts. You don't see the bigger picture yet. The idea of a suffering Messiah wasn't what Peter and the rest of the disciples wanted to hear, and Peter wasn't about to let it happen. Fast forward about a year and a half to the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter's there with Jesus and the other disciples when Judas arrives with the Roman soldiers and the Jewish officials. What is it Peter wants to do? What's he want to do? He wants to protect Jesus, right? He wants to defend Jesus. He doesn't want him to suffer. He still doesn't get it. Despite the number of times Jesus explained to them what he came to do. So Peter draws his sword and almost gets all of them killed. Blew it again. Blew it again. But when everybody else runs, Peter stays. He follows Jesus to this illegal nighttime trial. He wants to be there for Jesus. He wants to be near the action. He wants to influence the action. He wants to offer what help he can to protect his Lord. 
So he gains admission to the courtyard and tries to blend in near the fire. He's ready for action again. He's close enough to Annas' house to maybe get a glimpse of what's going on inside. Maybe hear some of the proceedings. Peter's standing there by the fire, buying time, looking for his opportunity. The first two denials were ones that he could shrug off fairly easily to avoid detection. But that third one, that third one, there's just going to be no escaping. John simply tells us he denied it. But Matthew and Mark tell us more. They tell us Peter calls down curses on himself. Not profanity, but essentially putting himself under oath so they would believe his lie. And then the rooster crows. And Peter knows his hopes for saving Jesus are over. It's not going to happen. The other gospel writers all tell us that Peter weeps bitterly. What's that about? I'll tell you. It's the sheer frustration of giving everything he has and coming up short. Peter is still trying to come up with human solutions. He has no idea of the enormity of Jesus' mission. And now he's checkmated. He can't pull it off. He's reached the end of himself. He's done all that he can, and it isn't enough. He is broken. And out of that brokenness, he breaks down and weeps. He's soon to find out, though, that God uses broken people. People who come to the end of themselves and find they can't do the very thing they've been trying so hard to do. Have you been there? You have. You're in good company. Think about Abraham. He was promised descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. But Sarah was well past her childbearing years. And so he tries to do it himself. Tries to fulfill the promise God made to him through his servant Hagar. And only when Abraham reaches the end of himself does God fulfill the promise. Think about Moses who spent 40 years learning to rule Egypt, followed by 40 years in exile, tending sheep. Moses had to come to the end of himself before God could use him. Think about a, a man named Saul of Tarsus, full of zeal, but it was misguided zeal. He had to be broken on the road to Damascus. And what followed was 17 years of isolation before God called him to active duty. But then he would be in a position to be used greatly of God. Only after he was broken. God works through broken people. Alan Redpath put it this way, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible man and crushes him. A.W. Tozer said, it is doubtful whether God can use a man greatly before he hurts him deeply. But think about what God did through this broken man named Abraham. He built a nation to reach the world. Think about what God did through this broken man named Moses. He set God's people free from slavery. Think about what God did through this broken man named Saul of Tarsus, also known as Paul, the apostle who launched the missionary enterprise. God works through broken people, not proud ones, not ones who are full of themselves. He works through people who know they don't have what it takes, who have come to the end of themselves and who are finally ready to call out to God and say, I can't do it. Save me. Help me, and if you can, use me. Now think about Peter. Jesus told Peter this day would come. In Luke's gospel, 
Jesus tells Peter in the upper room before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane that Peter was in for some sifting, but that he would come back from it. And when he did, he would have work to do. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, Jesus says, Satan has asked to sift all of you. It's a second person plural. All of you, Satan wants to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, second person singular. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when, not if, but when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew that Peter would fail. But Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not. The rest of the story of Peter's turning back to Jesus comes in chapter 21 of John's gospel. And we'll look at that in a few weeks. But suffice it to say for now that there is a rest of the story for Peter. And there is a rest of the story for you and for me. We all come to the point where we know we're at the end of ourselves. That we've given it our best shot and we've still come up short. And it's when we cry out to God that the rest of our story begins. It's how we come to faith. We try our own solutions in life and we realize they can't satisfy. We try to save ourselves. We try to be good enough. We try to measure up and we realize we can't. It's an important step, this coming to the end of ourselves. But when we realize we can't help ourselves, we find we can turn to the only one who can. Not only is it how we come to faith, it's how we live the Christian life as well. We all experience periodic breakings in life. And when we come to God with our brokenness and give our broken selves to him, we find that he can and does use us in amazing ways. Maybe you're going through one of those times of brokenness right now. Your life isn't working out the way you hoped it would. You've come to the end of yourself. This would be an excellent time to call out to God for help. Jesus said, whoever comes to him, he will never cast out. He proved it with Peter. He'll do the same for you. Would you pray with me? Father, we realize that we quickly come to the end of ourselves, that we are incapable of doing the very thing we want to do. And it breaks us with frustration, knowing we can't do it. And yet, Father, it brings us to you as well, and you're the one who can. And so we bring our brokenness to you, and we pray that out of that brokenness you would show us our need for you, And help us to rely on you to do the thing in us that we can't do ourselves. Father, I just pray that if there's someone here this morning that needs to say, Lord Jesus, I I can't measure up. I can't be good enough to earn heaven. But you paid the price for my sins so that I can have heaven as a free gift. And not only heaven, but a life that is full and abundant And so I turn to you now and I ask, do for me the thing I can't do for myself. Save me. Father, I pray for all of us that we would bring our brokenness to you, whatever our situation is, and find in you the one that can help us. Then grow us in our faith. Help us to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?
had a number of grandmas and grandpas with us who ought to be congratulated. So be sure you see one of them and congratulate them today and uh, grab a shoebox on your way out. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.